Chapter 9, Section 5. In this lesson, uh, we're going to focus on a strategy called completing the square. So this is just going to be one other trick that we're going to use to try and find the roots or the zeros of a quadratic function. We've done it by graphing. We've solved them by um, taking the square root of each side. We've solved them by factoring. Um, and now we're going to solve them by completing the square. So our goal is to solve quadratic equations by completing the square. Um, your school has a field with an area of 8,400 yards squared. The football coach is planning to section off the field to run a variety of practice drills. What is the value of x? And so um, we know that this, you know, the the area is length times width. So in this particular case, we have x plus 20 here, and this one is 2x is plus 20. And you know that those two multiplied together is equal to 8,400. So um, you can actually solve the system um, by setting the parts equal to zero, factoring. You know, you're going to have to FOIL it, um, set it equal to 8,400, then bring everything back over, and then use this method that we're going to talk about here. Um, I have a picture of a bridge here, and it doesn't look like the typical parabola. Most of the examples I've given you have been a parabola that opens down. This is an example of a kind of a parabola that opens up. Vocabulary. Um, the vocabulary word we have for this lesson is um, completing the square. And so the definition for completing the square is it's a method of solving quadratic equations. It turns every quadratic equation into the form x squared equals c. Um, and that's uh, basically how we're going to solve it. So you'll kind of understand it in a little bit. Um, we're going to hold off on the hinter characteristic and the examples and non-examples for a little bit. Um, if we don't do it in the video, then we'll do it in class. But it's not going to make any sense to you until you actually see the method. So it's kind of pointless to come up with it. All right, so let's take a look. You can model this process using algebra tiles. The algebra tiles at the right represent the expression x squared plus 8x. Um, and so you can kind of see what's there. Um, x squared is the big blue box, and then that, that green sticks are each x's, and there's eight of them. Here's the same expression rearranged to form part of a square. Notice that the x tiles have been split even, evenly into two groups of four. And so now what we're trying to do is figure out what individual numbers would make it um, finish up that perfect square. So you can complete the square by adding 4 squared or 16 ones tiles. So your answer is x plus 4 squared is kind of how um, it works. And we're going to do it in a way that doesn't involve the tiles, but I just kind of wanted you to see it. So in general, you can change the expression x squared plus bx into a perfect square trinomial by adding um, b divided by 2 squared to that thing. And it's basically the idea is that you're going to add that third term to get a perfect square trinomial. Now, you may not remember this, but you actually have already done this. You um, solved a problem like this. I believe it was the bonus question on your chapter 8 test. Um, and so you actually have already done these. So hopefully um, it'll sound kind of familiar to you. All right, so here is completing the square. Recall what a perfect square trinomial looks like. So this is our third exposure to perfect square trinomials. The first time was in chapter 7 when we were foiling them. And this was one of the lessons that we did where we did a shortcut. Actually, I think it was chapter 8. Um, we did a shortcut. And we learned that you could square the first one, square the second one, and then multiply them together and double it for the for the middle. Okay. Then we unfoiled them, so we factored them, and we did that by saying, hey, this is a perfect square whose square root is x. This is a perfect square whose square root is 3. When I multiply those together and double it, I get this. So this is what it looks like. Okay. The square root of each multiplied by 2 equals the middle. So we knew that was a perfect square trinomial. Which of the following expressions are perfect square trinomials? Let's just focus on that first. Okay, so is the, um, the first one, 9y squared plus 42y plus 49. Um, is 9y squared a perfect square? Yes, it's 3y. Is 49 a perfect square? Yes, it's 7. If I multiply that together and double it, do I get 42? Yes, I do. 4x squared perfect square whose square root is 2x. 16 is a perfect square whose square root is 4. If I multiply those together and double it, do I get 9? No. 
So that is not a perfect square trinomial. Last one, w squared is a perfect square whose square root is w. 4 is a perfect square whose square root is 2. If I multiply those together and double it, do I get 4? Yes, I do. So these two worked, and you could factor them using the perfect square trinomial. This one did not. All right, so now next step is to find the value of c that makes x squared minus 12x plus c a perfect square. So what we're attempting to do here is make this into a perfect square trinomial so that you can factor it, um, which seems really kind of a bizarre method for doing these, but it works, um, and it works almost every time. So um, definitely a, a method to use. Is it the one that you're going to choose when given an option? Probably not, but it works every time. So, you know, you could. So step number one, and, and this is the number I'm trying to fill in just so that we're clear. We're trying to figure out what to make C so that it is a perfect square trinomial so that when I'm done, I've got a number plus a number squared. And usually this is a variable, that, that first one. So find half of negative 12, which is negative 6. Square that answer and then divide it by the coefficient of the x squared value. So in our particular case, half of negative 12 is negative 6. So I kind of usually write it like this. I take negative 12 divided by 2, which is negative 6, and then square it, which is 36, and then divide it by the coefficient of x squared, which is 1. So my answer is 36, which means that if I put a 36 in there, I would get a perfect square trinomial. All right, so if it was x squared minus 12x plus 36, this is a perfect square trinomial. This is a perfect square whose square root is x. This is a perfect square whose square root is 6. If I multiply those together and double it, I get 12, and because it's minus, it's minus. I just completed the square. Find the value of C that makes this a perfect square. All right, so I'm going to take that middle term and I'm going to cut it in half. So I've got negative 24 divided by 2, which is negative 12. Then I'm going to square it, which is 144. And then I'm going to divide it by the coefficient of the first term, which is 16, and 144 divided by 16 is 9, which means that if I have 16t squared minus 24t plus 9, it's a perfect square trinomial. The square root of the first term is 4t. The square root of the last term is 3. The sine of the middle is minus. If I multiply these two things together and double it, I get negative 24, um, and so I know I'm correct. Now your turn. What is the value of C such that x squared plus 20x plus C is a perfect square trinomial? Okay, again, take the middle term, divide it by 2, square it, and then take that answer and divide it by the coefficient of the first thing. So the answer should be 100. All right, now, how does that feed in or tie into completing this square? Here's your procedure. The equation is not a perfect square trinomial. Therefore, you must complete the square to make it into a perfect square trinomial. So um, we want it to be a perfect square. It's not. And usually we use this method when we can't get it to, to be factored. So for example, if I looked at this problem normally, I would say, OK, put the terms in descending order they are. Factor out a GCF, there isn't one. So I'm going to try and find two numbers that multiply to give me negative 23 and add to give me negative 10. Okay, so um, negative 23 can only be found by doing negative 1 and 23 or 1 and negative 23. Neither of those are going to give me negative 10. So typically we would put like no solution or prime or can't do it, whatever. Um, and obviously you'll, you'll learn as we go through this chapter that there's always more than one way to do the problem. So, you know, if we don't graph it and we can't, take the square root. Remember, you can't take the square root if there's a b value. So if we can't do that, we can't take the square root. Um, then we would try factoring, um, but we can't factor this one. So there are a couple of other methods we're going to learn later, but 
let's try this completing the square. And some of you are going to love this method and just do it all the time. So if I look, okay, this is not a perfect square trinomial. This is, but this isn't. That's what this right here is what's screwing us up. And because that's not a perfect square, completing the square isn't going to work. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the negative 23 and start over. Okay, so here's what happens. First, you need to isolate the variables and move any non-variable terms to the opposite side. So it looks like this. The next thing that we're going to do is complete the square by following the steps listed above. So ultimately what we want to have happen is we want to replace that minus 23 with some number that will make the left-hand side a perfect square trinomial. Now, as you know, you can't just, you know, put a number in there randomly. Whatever we put there, we also have to put over here, okay? And so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to find half of negative 10, which is negative 5. Then we're going to square it, which is positive 25. Then we're going to divide it by this coefficient, which is a 1, so it's 25. So if I add 25 to each side, I am going to get a perfect square trinomial. So I'm going to add a 25 here. And like I said, I can't just randomly stick a number in. I have to do it to both sides. That's, that's the, what happens with an equation. Okay, so when we simplify that, here's what we get. All right, so now I'm going to factor the trinomial and simplify the opposite side. So I know it's a perfect square trinomial, which means it's x because the square root of x squared is x and the square root of 25 is 5 and the sign in the middle is minus and that's squared. Now, when we first learned this whole perfect square trinomial deal, I said that you could put the answer like this or like this. So some of you chose to write it like this and some of us chose to write it like this. You're going to learn in this, this method here that you can't, you don't want to write it with two parentheses because now here's what happens the entire left side is something that's squared to undo that i'm going to take the square root so this isn't a check mark it's a square root symbol okay i'm going to take the square root of the left hand side and the square root of the right hand side the square root of the left hand side is going to leave me with just x minus five because the square root of something squared is that thing the square root of 48 is 6.928, positive and negative. And here we go again with that positive and negative. Anytime you take the square root, it's both. Now I'm going to solve for x. Okay, so this is a very, very, very roundabout way of getting rid of the squared value. So my x's are going to cancel out. And on the other side, I have 5 plus 6.928 and 5 minus 6.928. Um, because that's what that plus minus sign means. So one of them is 5 plus 6.928, and then the other one is 5 minus 6.928. And if you wanted to just put 6.9, that's fine. I mean, typically we go to the nearest tenth. So those are my two answers. Yikes. Okay, let's try one. I know it's going to be kind of crazy, but let's try it. So the first thing I look at is I'm going to put everything on one side just to see on the off chance that maybe it's already a perfect square trinomial. So this is a perfect square, but this isn't. So I don't have a perfect square trinomial because I'd have to have both of them being perfect squares. Okay, so this one's great. The x squared is great. This one is screwing me up. So let's get rid of it and start over. Okay, not working, so we're going to start over. So I have x squared plus 9x is equal to negative 15. Now notice the big gap I left. Um, I know that I'm going to put something in there and then of course that same thing on the other side to create a perfect square trinomial. Okay, so we're going to take that middle term, divide it by 2, square it, and then divide it by 1. Okay, so um, and here's where, don't convert it to a decimal. It's just going to make life really not pleasant. So I have 9 over 2. 9 squared is 81. 2 squared is 4. So it's 81 fourths divided by 1 is 81 fourths. So I'm going to put 81 fourths on each side. Okay? Next step is to factor. So the square root of x squared is x. And the square root of 81 fourths is 9 halves squared positive, okay, and that is equal to negative 15 plus 81 fourths, if I do that on my calculator, okay, negative 15 plus 81 fourths 
is 5 and 1 fourth, which is 21 fourths, okay? Next step is to get rid of the squared value by taking the square root. So now I'm taking the square root of 5.25, or 5 and 1 fourth, and I get x plus 9 halves is equal to positive and negative 2.3-ish. All right? Next step is going to be to subtract 9 halves from each side. And here's how I tend to write it, just so I don't screw things up. Okay? I'm subtracting 9 halves from each side, so it's negative 9 halves plus and minus 2.3. So, negative... 9 halves is negative 4.5 plus 2.3 is negative 2.2 and negative 4.5 minus 2.3 is about negative 6.8, give or take a smidge. Okay, crazy, 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 I know. This is definitely one of those examples where you need to write down the procedure so it makes sense. Okay, if your original problem does not start with a term that is a perfect square, then you're going to need to multiply the entire equation by something that will make it a perfect square first and then finish the process. So um, in these examples that we've done so far, this was a great perfect square. This is what screwed us up. That's why we moved this one and kept this one. Same thing here. This was a perfect square. Um, oh, sorry. Let's go up one more step. This was a perfect square, but the 23 wasn't. That's why we moved it and got rid of it. But what happens if the first term isn't even a perfect square? Okay, so for example, 2x squared minus 10x minus 20 equals 8. The very first thing that we typically would do would be to move the 8 over to see, um, to get it to be negative 28. Um, but hopefully you have a little bit of fore forethought to say, Gosh, that's not a perfect square. That's not going to work. And you have choices, folks. So, you know, in this particular case, maybe because you see that, um, you know, if, if we move it over, 2x squared minus 10x minus 28 equals 0. Okay, this isn't a perfect square, and neither is that. So they both are messed up. You have options. You may want to look and say, hey, they're all divisible by 2. I'm going to divide everything by 2. Because I can do that because it's an equation. And then x squared is a perfect square. Negative 14 isn't, so you're going to have to start over anyway. But that is totally an option. The other option would be to multiply by something to make it a perfect square. So, for example, if I multiply by 2, now I have 4x squared minus 20x minus 40 equals 16. This is now a perfect square. This is still not a perfect square. So we're going to move it to the other side. And it wouldn't have mattered if I had brought this over because negative 56 isn't a perfect square either. So we're just messed up all over the place, okay? So we're going to move it over and start over, okay? All right, so I am going to put in a number here, and it's got to be the same number on both sides. That's going to make it a perfect square trinomial. So I'm going to take negative 20, put it in half, which is negative 10, square it, which is 100, and then divide it by 4, which gives me 25. So 25 is the number that I'm adding to both sides. My left-hand side is now a perfect square trinomial. My right-hand side is now the number 81. Factor it. So the square root of 4x squared is 2x, and the square root of 25 is 5, and the sign in the middle is negative, and it's the whole thing squared. Now I'm going to take the square root of each side, because the whole point of that was to get it into something squared, and now I'm going to take the square root of each side, which just leaves me with 2x minus 5 equals 81 is a perfect square. So the square root is positive and negative 9. I'm going to add 5 to each side, okay, and, and you can do this in as many steps as you want. I could have said, okay, now I have 2x equals 14, and I have... 2x equals negative 4, because 5 plus 9 is 14, and 5 minus 9 is negative 4, and then I would divide both sides by 2. That, that's an option. I kind of did it on the smart board in like one step, but my choices are x equals 7 and x equals negative 2, and both of those are, are correct. And so, um, you know, if I had graphed this thing, 
it would look like this. This is where it would be crossing. This is one that opened up. So somewhere in here, if we work our way um, into the middle, my axis of symmetry would be right in the middle here. And somewhere it would have looked like that. If I had graphed it, just so you kind of get the visual of what's going on. Okay. Yikes. All right. Finding the vertex by completing the square. Find the vertex of x squared plus 6x plus 8 equals y. Now think about what the vertex is. The vertex is the highest or lowest point of our parabola. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 8 from each side, and it gives me x squared plus 6x equals y minus 8. The next thing that I'm going to do, and, and we're completing the square, so when you think about what's going on, this is a perfect square, but this isn't. So that's why I'm moving it over and starting over. Okay? But in this particular case, there's a y value, and so it's not a 0. So it's going to look a little bit different. So now I'm going to complete the square. So I'm going to take that 6, and I'm going to cut it in half. Then I'm going to square it. So 6 divided by 3 is 2, and maybe I should show it this way so it's a little less confusing. So 6 divided by 3 is 2. Then I'm going to square that, which is 4. And then I'm going to divide it by 1, which is 4. So 4. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize wholeheartedly. I probably just totally screwed you up. <sighs> divide it in half, and I put a 3, which is 3. Oh, yo, yo. Square it, which is 9 and then divide it by 1, which is 9. So I'm adding 9 to this side, and I'm adding 9 to this side. So I get x squared um, plus 6x plus 9 equals y plus 1. Then I'm going to rewrite it. Okay. So um, factor the left-hand side. It's x plus 3, the whole thing, squared. And then the right-hand side is y plus 9. And so just so that you kind of know this is, this is the end here, you're going to take the x value with the opposite sign, and you're going to take the y value with the opposite sign, and that is your vertex. So we're completing the square by doing it that way. Um, and you can set it up as a completing the square problem. Now, the other option, of course, would be to find the vertex the way we did in the past, where we would um, find the axis of symmetry. So it's in descending order. I'm going to take the b value over negative 2 times the a value. So it's 6 over negative 2, which is negative 3. So that's the x value. And then if I plug that back in for all the x's, um, negative 3 squared is 9. Plus 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. Plus 8 equals negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1, and that's where the y value comes from. So either way, it doesn't matter. You, you pick the method that works best for you. Okay, now let's try it. So oops. Um, first thing we're going to do here is find the vertex of each parabola using the method of completing the square. So in the first part, um, the 10 is, is going to be the issue. It's not a perfect square, so I'm going to subtract 10 from each side which gives me y minus 10 is equal to x squared plus 4x, okay? Then I'm going to add something to both sides. So I'm going to add something there, and I'm going to add something over here, okay? And it's going to be the same something. So I'm going to take my b value, cut it in half, square it. So 4 divided by 2 is 2, 2 squared is 4, and 4 divided by divided by 4 is 1. So I'm going to add 4 to each side. So on the left-hand side, I get y minus 6. And on the right-hand side, when I factor it, I get x plus 2 squared. Okay, now if you recall, that's all we need to do because then what happens is that I want the opposite of this, so it's going to be negative 2. And I want the opposite of this, oops, this, which is 6. So my vertex is negative 2, 6. Over here, this is a perfect square. Yay, this is not boo, so we need to get rid of it. So we get y minus 34 is equal to x squared plus 12x. Now I need to add something to both sides to make this a perfect square trinomial. In order to do that, I need to complete the square. So I'm going to take that middle term, divide it by 2. 12 divided by 2 is 6. Square it. 6 squared is 36. 
and then divide it by the first term, which is 1. So I'm adding 36 to each side. All right, so on the left-hand side, I get y plus 2. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to factor that. And the square root of x squared is x. The square root of 36 is 6. The sine of the middle is plus. And so my x value is the opposite of 6, which is negative 6. And my y value is the opposite of 2, which is negative 2. All right. Next concept, completing the square when a is not equal to 1. So um, if my a value, that squared value, is not equal to 1, what is going to happen? So you're planting a flower garden consisting of three square plots surrounded by a one-foot border. The total area of the garden and the border is 100 feet squared. What is the side length of each square plot? So I know the area of the garden and the border is 100 feet squared. And I have um, the side length of x of each square plot. So write an equation that you can use to solve the problem. I'm doing length times width. My length is 3x's plus 2 because I have 1, 2, 3, and then 2 of these. And my width is 1x and 1, 1, so x plus 2. I'm going to multiply it all together because that's length times width and that's equal to 100. Then I'm going to move everything over to one side um, and when I do that I realize that I get 3x squared plus 8x plus negative 96. So that's that's not solving anything for us. So we're going to just move stuff over to the other side right away. Okay. Then I discover that 3x squared is not a perfect square, so I can't complete the square with that. So here they chose to divide by 3, but you could certainly have chosen to multiply by something that would make it a perfect square. It's just 3 is kind of a hard one because there's not much you can multiply by to get a perfect square. So they divided. Either way is totally fine. Then they completed the square and then solved the problem. So same exact thing, it's just it's way uglier because you've got that first term that's just not cooperating. So in this case, suppose the total area of the garden and border in problem 4 is 150 feet. What is the side length of each square plot round to the nearest 100th? Okay, so we're going to go back up here and we have um, 3x plus 2 times x plus 2. 3x plus 2 times x plus 2, and that is equal to 150 feet squared instead. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to FOIL it. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to set each party. It just doesn't work that way because of this 150. So 3 times x is 3x squared, plus 3x times 2 is 6x, plus 2 times x is 2x, plus 2 times 2 is 4, and that's equal to 150. Now, here's what I would do. I would say, okay, 3x squared plus 8x, um, and then I would move this 154 over because there is a possibility that it actually is a perfect square, which would really help us immensely. So negative 146 is equal to 0. Okay, now I look at that and say, oh man, 3 is not a perfect square. That's kind of a bummer. Is there anything that I could multiply 3 by to get a perfect square? And if you think about it, what, what would give me a perfect square? 9 would give me a perfect square. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that whole mess up there was pretty darn ugly. So I'm going to try multiplying instead of dividing. Let's multiply the whole thing by 3. All right, 3 times 3 would be 9x squared. Now it's a perfect square. 3 times 8 is 24x. And 3 times 146 is 438, so negative 438. Okay, is negative 438 a perfect square? No. But 9x squared is, so we're halfway there. So the thing that's screwing us up right now is this negative 438. So I'm going to add 438 to each side. All right, so now I have 9x squared plus 24x plus, I'm going to have to put something in there because I want to have a perfect square trinomial, and right now I certainly do not. And whatever I put on that side, I also have to put on that side. Okay, so I've got to figure out what to put in the box. So I need to complete the square. So I take the middle term, divide it by 2, which is 12, square it, which is 144, and then divide it by 9. 
and that is 16. Woohoo! Okay, so I'm going to add 16 to each side. Okay, next step, factor the left. So it's a perfect square trinomial. The square root of 9x squared is 3x, and the square root of 16 is 4, and the sign in the middle is plus. And just to check it, if I multiply it together and double it, I get 24. On the right-hand side, I have 438 plus 16, which is 454. Next step, square root to get rid of the squared. If I do it to one side, I have to do it to the other. So that leaves me with 3x plus 4 is equal to the square root of 454, which is both positive and negative 21.3, let's say. All right, now I need to get x by itself, so I'm going to subtract 4 from each side. Here's how that looks, in my opinion. Negative 4 plus n minus 21.3. I think it's easier. And now I'm going to divide by 3. So I'm going to solve this problem twice. Once, it's negative 4 plus 21.3 divided by 3. And the second time, it's negative 4 minus 21.3 divided by 3. So negative 4 plus 21.3 divided by 3 is approximately 5.8, give or take a smidge. And negative 4 minus 21.3 divided by 3 is negative 8.4, give or take a smidge. So uh, 5.8 and negative 8.4. And um, when you think about the fact that it's a story problem, okay, you don't want to go with the negative because you can't have a negative dimension, and that's why we only have 5.8. All right, I know this was a horrendously long lesson, and I'm so sorry. This is definitely by far the hardest method for solving um, quadratic functions. There are a handful of problems here that I would like you to try. Some are a little harder than others. Um, we will work through as much as we can together in class. This is definitely one that I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to do the basic assignment um, because the story problems just add another dimension. And um, number 32 is the only story problem on the basic, and we'll do that one together. So I would really um, encourage you to do that basic assignment. If you have questions, let me know. Good luck.